Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's live stream, where I'll be covering Surveyor 2.0. Let me know how the audio is and how the stream quality is. I'm having uh, OBS is being a little silly. It's been a while, obviously, since I've done one of these streams. So I just want to make sure everything is working. You guys can see it. You got the link. Obviously, there's people here uh, and things are looking good. YouTube is telling me that the bit rate is not high enough, but I there's not much I can do about that. I'm plugged into my router right now, so it's about as high as it's going to be. All right, so it seems like you guys might be able to see everything and hear everything. Um, let me know if the music is too loud or anything like that, too, obviously. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat here because obviously I want to interact with you guys. I want to tell you, first of all, the settings that I'm using on YouTube here. Uh, are set to be a higher quality so you guys will get a better stream but that does mean that there's going to be a more of a lag uh, between when I see your comments and when I respond to them so if you guys have a, a question or a comment or something like that you want me to answer uh, I might have missed it but uh, I will try to answer them but it will take a few seconds before you guys hear or see that answer um, so uh, hopefully you guys have some questions for me for Surveyor 2 I'm going to keep an eye on the chat as we go. Um, turn down this music in my ears. <clears throat> All right, so uh, another thing that I want to note before we get started here. Uh, well, a couple things I want to note. Uh, the first is I don't really have like a real set format for this. I'm going to, I don't want to say I'm winging it, but uh, I'm kind of winging it. I don't have like notes or anything like that that I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this and talk about this. So I'm just going to go through and do this as intuitively as possible. And then I'm going to base a lot of what I talk about on uh, with your uh, with your questions. Uh, the second thing is, you guys probably know that I work for N3V now, and I've been doing stuff for N3V. This is not an N3V-sponsored stream. This is just me talking about uh, things that I understand uh, for Surveyor 2. They're not paying me for this or anything like that. So these are all uh, my own opinion here. I just have to give that disclaimer so there's no confusion. This is just my own uh, thought process and experience with Surveyor 2 and how I use it. And I think everybody is going to use Surveyor 2 a little bit differently. Um, there's different ways to set, up, set it up and different ways to, uh, to make use of it. So I'm just basically going to be showing you the way that I use it and you can kind of uh, take away what you want from that. Uh, but a lot of people have been asking me to do one of these streams. Um, because uh, Surveyor 2 did introduce a whole lot of new tools and a whole new way of doing a lot of different things, and it totally changed how we build in Surveyor. Um, and uh, I know a lot of you guys have been sort of having some trouble doing some basic stuff, so I guess I'll try to cover the basics today and uh, maybe some more like advanced things. Uh, I expect this to maybe co go for like an hour or so, but we'll see uh, where this where it goes from here. Uh, so let me look at the chat here and see where we're at. Uh, the other thing is I want to sort of format this in, in a way that um, people who aren't watching this live will be able to come back and uh, re-watch this and it'll make sense. And uh, I think in YouTube Studio I could put like chapter markers and that sort of thing. So hopefully that'll make it easier for people to navigate and hopefully my, uh, my scatterbrain uh, is a little less scattered than usual, but uh, there's no guarantees on that. <clears throat> um, let me just check the stats and everything here. It looks like we got 36 people watching. Cool. That works for me. <coughs> I don't see any questions just yet. Let me just check a couple things uh, that I need to check and make sure. I did schedule a Facebook post. I just want to make sure that that went live too, so other people who are on Facebook know what is going on. Yep, that's there. I posted on Discord. So I think we're probably ready to sort of get started here. Uh, oh, the other thing I want to mention is, uh, and I guess I, I should point it out because it's going to change how you guys see what I'm doing. I bought one of these. Let's see if I can get it on camera here. Okay, this is a uh, Razer Tartarus V2. This is like a little one-handed keyboard uh, that you can sort of map out any way you want. I have this, I've been using it for a couple weeks now. Uh, I've mapped it out to be my arrow keys, 
and the uh, any other hotkeys that I use. So if you see me doing things like really quickly, it's because I'm doing it all with just my left hand on this little keyboard. I've got the undo button uh, mapped to just be one button. I've got, you know, the option button mapped and, and all that. So, uh, you know, if at any point I'm going too fast, I guess is what I'm saying is uh, you could just let me know, but that that is why. <coughs> all right. Um... All right, so I guess the first thing to cover here um, is uh, the interface, and I already see a question that is uh, pretty relevant here. Is Surveyor 2 only available on subscription, or can you get it as a one-time purchase? It is currently available in Trains Platinum, so that does not require a subscription. It is now part of Trains 22 Platinum Edition, which I think is like $69 or $70, something like that. Um, it was for a little while part of the Trains Plus package, which is a subscription package, but now it is in uh, in Platinum. Um, train is. Uh, are there any plans on Severe Two going to Trains Nineteen? No. Uh, there. I think the N3V is done with uh, supporting Nineteen. Uh, again, I guess another disclaimer is that I'm just their social media guy. With, like I, for N3V, like I don't work on the game development or anything like that. So a lot of the technical stuff and things like that I don't know anything about. I just am making their videos and doing social media and stuff like that and just promoting the game. Uh, so uh, I don't know a lot of the, the technicalities of, uh, of that, but I think to answer that question, uh, they are not gonna be bringing this to Trains 2019. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I guess the first thing to, to get started with is uh, what is Surveyor 2? So we all know and love uh, Surveyor Classic, which we do still have in Trains 22. We know it uh, has these tabs that pop out. Topology, your ground textures, objects, track, tools, layers, and trains. And we used to have to kind of thumb through all of these and switch around our tools if we wanted to place a tree and move it or rotate it. You had to continue to switch your tools. Well, in uh, Surveyor 2, that's all kind of just built into like one tools tab. Um, so they call these tool windows palettes. So I'll be calling them palettes going forward. You can move these around and set them up any way you want, whatever works for you. Um, this is how I have mine set up, but you could rearrange them any way that you want. Uh, we'll start on the right side here. This first palette is the tools palette. Underneath that is the tool options. It is a separate palette from the tools tab itself. Underneath that, we've got an info tab, and then we've got our scrapbook. And on the left side here, I've got a preview. So um, preview will show you what asset you have selected in your, uh, your window here or in your list. You've got your asset lists, which can be filtered by textures, scenery objects, and so on. I'll get back to that. And then we've got our layers palette here as well. Uh, one thing to note is that this preview window is not uh, present by default. You have to enable it. And to do that, you click uh, this window tab here and you can select asset preview to, uh, to bring it up. And by default, I guess it wants to put it over here on the right side. I like it on the left because it's right above the I like having it right above the list there, uh, so I can just sort of look and see. Uh, the other thing to note is that your asset list here can be sorted by uh, like a list like this, or it can be sorted by thumbnails by clicking this. So whatever you fancy, whatever works for you, you know, you can you can kind of switch it up that way. Uh, I see the chat is moving. Uh, what do we got over here? Uh, yes, I will talk about the scrapbook tool. I will get to that in a few minutes Because uh, that is probably one of the most powerful new tools uh, Alone in this whole surveyor 2 thing. What's going on Audi? Well, we got Audi here. Awesome uh, Yes, we are on the PNB as well. Uh, we are up in Grafton. Uh, I haven't started on the next episode yet So this is the steel mill that was in the previous episode No spoilers in this one so far uh, all right, so um, let's get started. I guess we'll talk about the tools tab first. Uh, within the tools tab, you've got your brush tool, which allows you to put your textures down as well as scrapbook 
and uh, terraforming. So this is basically one brush tool to rule them all. Uh, the next one we have here is the placement tool. So this will allow you to place your assets wherever you are trying to place them. Uh, and a handy tip to note right here is when you're placing assets, uh, if you just press and hold, like I'm holding down the left mouse button, I'll get a preview of what it looks like so I can actually sort of see where it's going to go before I let go of left mouse button. Um, so that is a nice little tip there. Uh, this next tool is the eyedropper tool. This is essentially the get tool, the little, you know, hooky whatever thing that you would use to, uh, to sample uh, either a ground texture or an asset to get it. Um, the next one here we've got is our free move. Uh, this allows you to, it's basically just a move tool to, to move around any asset you place down. The find adjustment tool is the next one here in the middle. Uh, this is my personal favorite one. Uh, when you're using this, it allows you, it gives you this uh, like XYZ axis thing uh, on whatever asset you have selected. So this allows you to do some fine adjustments or if you want to uh, roll an asset, let's say, like you can do it from here or you could just move it straight up or straight across on axis, uh, which is really nice. And the last tool we have is the marquee tool. This allows you to draw out, you know, a marquee and get a sample of an area. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. This allows you to do copying and pasting and uh, add things to your scrapbook. So we will, <coughs> we will come, oh, sorry. I think I heard my microphone pop when I coughed there. Uh, fall allergies are killing me. Um, so we will come back to that in a moment. Um, Let's see here. Yes, we are on the PNB. Uh, you must have missed that. We are we are on the PNB. We're not going to work on the PNB, but I figured if I do anything that's worth saving, you know, this is the place to do it. This is where that lumber industry is going to go, by the way, in the next episode. Um, all right. So the next uh, section we have here is the tool options. These are basically all the modifiers for each of our uh, tools that we have here. You've got your classic radius size to change the radius of your paintbrush. And that apparently has no limit anymore. So if you want to paint an area that's like an entire baseboard, you can. Um, you could even do multiple baseboards. Like the, you could just keep scaling this up. I, I don't think it stops anywhere. Let's see if we can go past 999. Yeah. So that allows you to go super large. Or if you have, uh, if you're in the HD terrain update, which is Trains Plus only, you can go less than five meters and you can get these really tiny brushes. The PNB right now is not. Um, an HD map just yet, um, so I won't be converting that, but you could see how small this uh, little brush radius is. It's actually small enough that you could sign your name on your map if you wanted to, and it would look pretty, pretty reasonable and pretty good. Uh, the next uh, section we have here is the height section. This allows you, obviously, if you, um, uh, if you are doing some terraforming and you want to raise or lower the terrain, it'll be based on that. Uh, I believe that you can also use this to set the height of an object. Uh, I, um, maybe not. Okay. Th there is a way to do that through here, I believe. Um, the next one here is a new addition for Surveyor 2 and for trains as a whole, and I really, really like this. This is the sensitivity setting. Uh, also, if I'm going too fast through this, uh, let me know. Um, sensitivity is super nice for your brush tool. So essentially it's like, um, what would be the equivalent of it? Uh, it's like a transparency, right? So right now I've got it at 20% sensitivity. So if I go place down a, let's just grab like grass, uh, and I want to paint this down, it's a little bit, like you can see it's really, really light as opposed to if I turn it up to 100% and I click, it's at full saturation, I guess is the way to put it. So this is really nice, a uh, really great tool for um, for ground texturing and it's gonna come in, it's gonna be really important with the HD terrain update because you're gonna be limited to 16 textures per baseboard. So to get a little bit more variety, you can layer them and uh, transition them a little bit more easily. Uh, the next one here is the grade. Uh, grade tool, so this applies to things like your uh, your splines and your track and that sort of thing. So you can apply a gradient to it. I think if I simply, whoops, if I simply make a selection here and I think I have to do it by the end. 
maybe not. Essentially, if I take this asset and I put a grade in here, let's say, let's do something crazy, like 25% grade. Oh, it did it, okay. Did it because I had it selected. You have to have the, uh, you have to have the asset selected. But now if I want to place down this road marking with that grade already selected, it will try to do a 25% grade, but there's no terrain underneath of it, so uh, it's just going to snap to the ground. Uh... Angle, I don't know if I know what this has to do with. There's certain things on here that I'm not fully sure what they do. If I'm being perfectly honest, like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm still learning about Surveyor 2 and I'm learning by doing. So a lot of this has just been through my own experimentation. Uh, I was never like formally trained on this or anything like that. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know what angle does. That might have something to do with splines. I might have to ask about that. Rotation should be pretty obvious. This allows you to rotate assets. Um, I believe that this would apply, let's say, if I am placing an asset. Let's undo. Maybe not. So, essentially, what... When... How do I phrase this here? When you can use these tools, like when they become relevant to whatever you're doing, they will be highlighted. So it doesn't seem like either one of those. I, I believe the rotation tool allows you to actually like set the rotation value down before you place the asset, uh, but I could be wrong on that. The scale tool has to do with your, um, uh, your scrapbook as well as your textures. So if you guys might remember, um, in Surveyor Classic, I believe there was a similar scale tool. Uh, right now it's set at the lowest, and I can crank this up to 100, and we get a larger scale on that texture. Uh, but this will come into play a little bit more with the scrapbook, which you'll see in a few moments. And let's see. Ah, uh, what's up, Bill M? <laughs> Oh, we got people from all over the world joining in. Very cool. Um, okay, so that was, what did I just talk about? The scale. Uh, the next one, intensity. I have absolutely no idea what this controls. Uh, I think that this has to do with texturing and something to do with the scrapbook. But to be perfectly honest, I don't know what intensity uh, tends to work towards. So you can see here, now that I have the texture tool applied, uh, this does, these tools highlight. So these ones that are highlighted are what will be, uh, what are relevant to that particular tool. So it might be like, yeah, so if I switch it to ground height, oh, I guess I should I'll backtrack a little bit in a second. Um, I should have showed you guys the, the drop downs as well. Um, so yeah, intensity, I, I don't really know what that has to do with. Condition, I believe has to do with your track. So you can highlight your track and maybe change the track condition. I don't know, I believe, let's see, let's change it to like 61% and see. So I don't, I don't really know what condition does either. I I'm thinking that it has to do with your track, but again, I don't know. Uh, let me go right back up to the tools at the top here. When you have your brush set, uh, as I had mentioned initially, the brush controls everything. The brush tool controls your ground height, uh, your terraforming, your, your texturing, and the scrapbook, as well as turf effects and all that. So in order to change what it is doing, you use this little drop down here. So you can see ground height, ground texture, scrapbook data, uh, turf effects, uh, and these are both turf effects and clutter. The more, um, what do you call them? I guess effect layers that you add, you'll have more things here and you can add them from here. So depending on what you have selected, uh, it will change what it does. So let's see if we go to ground height, the next tab down, you've got height up, height down, set height and grade. So all the similar tools that we are used to. Uh, if you want to set the height, you can just do it uh, right here. We could say like 100. And now when I go to paint, it's automatically just going to bring that all the way up to 100. Uh, so that's handy if you know what height you're trying to, to bring it to or if you need to, you know, set a value and plateau something up. Uh, that would be the way to do it. Uh, oh, the sensitivity also applies to the brush tool when it comes to terraforming. So if you, uh, let's see, we'll do height up. We've got it at 100% right now. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see how sort of touchy it is. Uh, if I turn this down to 1%, now you can see it's a little bit more uh, gradual. Mm. 
Intensity works for turf effects. Oh, okay, okay, that does make sense. I, I that, that makes sense. Um, okay, so what was the other thing? Ground texture, yeah, it has to do with you got scale and you got rotation and scrapbook data. Uh, we'll get, we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to the scrapbook just because it's like a lot to cover all at once. Uh, so I'm not even gonna touch on that right now. Uh, the next section here is color. So this is a color tint. Uh, this is also a new feature. I don't know if this came with, I guess it did come with Surveyor 2. This allows you to add a color tint to your, uh, your textures and, oops. I've got it on scrapbook data. Um, I have not done anything with this yet, so I actually don't know. I think you have to create an, an effect layer for it first. I'm not really sure. I have I have not really used that. I used it a little bit in the HD terrain video that I did for N3V, um, and I haven't used it since. But this does allow you to create a, uh, a tint to it. Um, which ultimately, when we all end up doing HD terrain and we're limited to 16 textures per baseboard, this is going to be the way that you get variety. There is absolutely no limit to the amount of, well, that I understand at least, to the amount of uh, color effect layers that you can add. Uh, so this will allow you to add something like if we wanted to darken up this pavement, I would probably go to like, you know, some kind of a gray. Oops. And find some kind of a gray value to get a little bit more variety. Um, which is actually kind of nice because if you have a ground texture or pavement texture or a grass texture or anything like that that you really like and you just wish it was a little bit darker or a little bit brighter, you can now add another layer to that and, uh, and you can accomplish that. I think you have to create an effect layer for that. Let's try that really quick. Color. Yeah, so we'll just call this tint. And I think you just leave it all as default. So let's, um, we'll just pick like a crazy color. It, I, again, I don't know if this is a HD terrain thing only. Yeah, it might just be for, like, once you update your map to HDT. I, I, I honestly am not 100% sure. Like I said, this is this map is not HD terrain just yet. Maybe at the end of the stream, we'll start a new route, and um, <coughs> we'll just we'll make it HD, and uh, we'll see. Well, actually, no, you know what? I can... Uh, we'll come back to that. I can create another baseboard on here that is HD and then just delete it, but I'm not even going to bother with that. Um, all right, so that is that you can this also I'm not really sure what this applies to shape like I I've changed this before and it doesn't seem to change anything like it's still like I say square It's still a circle. So I don't really know what this is supposed to change. It doesn't change the marquee size either Like if you're gonna do a selection, so I have I have no idea uh, the info panel is uh, is useful <laughs> in, in, in some regards. It's not uh, necessarily something you're going to use all the time, uh, but it does give you some really good information. Uh, if I'm moving around here, you can see where it says focus. It's got some coordinates there. This is literally your position in the world, your XYZ position. Um, uh, I don't really know when you would ever need to use this. Like maybe somebody like me might be able to use this for like setting my camera or something like that you know if I want to do like a, a matched shot uh, of some kind but the regular user I can't imagine a use case where you're gonna necessarily use that um, but like if I I can go through and change this to like what are we at 1807 so as I'm like keying stuff in you know it's changing where I am and uh, I might end up just breaking the game because I'm just gonna be way too far away so I <laughs> teleported myself way off of the baseboard so we have to wait and fly back here I'll take a look at the chat drink some coffee in the meantime okay so let me get back to Grafton I have no idea where I went okay so it took me like really far away so yeah I can't really imagine like a use case unless there's a way that you can bookmark those yeah, I, I don't know. Oh, well, actually, so here it just said use height for brush. 
So I guess if you're on higher terrain or something like that, let's see if I can find. So now minus 1.5 meters, uh, I can copy this into my, my tools here. So that might be useful. Uh, the next part here, uh, let me select an asset. Uh, this next section here allows you to, this tells you where whatever asset you have selected uh, is actually located. So you could kind of shift it around if you wanted to. Uh, this gets obviously pretty uh, helpful if you need to change the height or if you need like a really specific height that you want to uh, set your tree to or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, you could go in tenths of a meter, I believe. Uh, so that is super helpful. Um, or if you need to match something like up the placement of something, you can easily use that. Uh, this next one is the rotation, I believe. So this will allow you to tilt and pan an asset if it has the ability to do so. Uh, this particular tree, you cannot do it with at all, but pretty much every other asset that I've used. Oh man. So I'm having this issue with Surveyor 2. This is, this is a complete aside. And I don't know what is happening, but like sometimes when I save certain assets, these ones right now, are like getting duplicated or they're they're like moving it's really it's really really weird i don't know what the issue is and I, I did bring it up to the team but like i had that issue someplace else i don't know if it happens when i save or i do a save as or if i merge or, or what it is but um yeah i don't know certain things are duplicating i guess this is a good point to mention uh i keep selecting assets so just by clicking on it i didn't even talk about that um, in with either one of these two, two tools here, the fine adjustment tool or the free move tool, uh, you can click on any asset to, uh, to essentially highlight it and grab it. Whenever it's highlighted, that is the asset that you have selected. Um, and then, like I said, I usually use this fine adjustment tool and it allows me to kind of do whatever I want with the asset. So like I said before, if we want to change like the rotation, pretty much everything now <laughs> allows for rotations. Uh, that information does get transcribed down here into the uh, ROT little drop down. Uh, this next section here allows you to, it tells you what route, or excuse me, what layer your selected asset is placed on. Uh, so right here we can see that it is on the route layer. If I want to change it to a different one, I can. I still have no idea what binding does, um, so I, I don't know. Uh, and this is a very important thing that I just found out this week if you want to name an object uh you used to have to go into the edit properties and then you like you could name it in there that is gone for some reason i don't know if that's a bug maybe i'm missing something but when you go to edit properties now you can't rename it in here if you want to rename an asset it's over here it is in this info panel and that goes for everything so if you have like a track mark place it. Ah, I got YouTube revision. What is happening? There we go. Uh, if you want to rename this track mark, you do it over here now. And then you can just sort of highlight everything and say this is Grafton Station. And then I hit enter. I don't know if you need to hit enter or if you just click out, but then it renames it automatically. So uh, again, it, that's sort of a weird choice uh or a, a weird development decision in my opinion like i feel like if you're in the properties you should still be able to rename it but i only just discovered this this week so you guys should also know that as well that if you want to rename an object track marks anything like that you do it over here uh slightly confusing sort of thing oh the other thing that i should mention if you want to change the radius of a track mark uh or a trigger and i'm just going to mention this now because i'm on it uh, there used to be a tool in Surveyor Classic that allowed you to change this big red area. That's like the, the sensitivity area. Uh, that doesn't seem to be present anymore in Surveyor 2 uh, specifically, but you can still change it by clicking this little green pixel here and you grab it and you drag. I don't know if this is an intended function or not, but this is just one of those things that I discovered. It could be a bug. It could be something that disappears eventually. Um, but again, you used to be able to uh, just set it with a tool, but now you kind of click and drag. There is no interface or anything like that there anymore. So I find that a little strange. I don't know. I'm going to mention it to the team if that's intended or not. I have no idea. Maybe they're going to watch this video and somebody will, will notate it. 
Okay, let's see. Uh, let me make sure everything is good on the stream here. Wow, I've been streaming for 34 minutes already. Holy cow. Uh, we got 52 people watching. Awesome. What's up, everybody? Thanks for hanging out on this Saturday. I hope you guys uh, got to catch the eclipse. If uh, if you were in a region to do that right here, it's it's uh, Saturday, so it's raining. So <laughs> we didn't get any view or anything. Uh, but I hope you guys were able to get that. I almost postponed the stream a little bit because I thought it was going to cut it close. And I, I kind of totally forgot that that was happening. But... All right, anyway, moving right along. The next section is the scrapbook. Uh, again, like I said, this is just how I have my windows set up. I'm gonna come back to the scrapbook because we can kind of cover the rest of this stuff pretty quickly on, in these tool windows. Preview window over here should be pretty obvious, pretty self-explanatory. Um, this allows you to see what asset you have selected in a 3D thing. You can no longer click and drag it to like rotate it. It is just completely uh, fixed. Um, so then that brings us into our asset palette over here. Um, there is something specific with this drop-down filter list, filter selection, and filter visibility. I'm, I don't know, I haven't experimented with this enough, but I believe this applies to, like, if you draw a marquee and select a whole bunch of stuff, I think you can filter it. I, I don't know, there's a way to, like, filter it in the asset list or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I, I honestly have no idea about that. I, this is one of the sections that Paul has talked to me about. And uh, when we're streaming together, he has done some stuff with it, but I need to be refreshed on that. Um, the next section should be kind of familiar to you guys. Uh, you've got ground textures, scenery meshes, scenery splines, track splines, track mesh. So these are like your track side ob objects like signals, track markers, and so on and so forth. Your trains uh, and presets, which I believe are turf effects things that you can place down. Uh, you could also filter through everything in here. So now the interesting thing with Surveyor 2 is it, it almost has Content Manager built into the UI. Uh, so if you... It, it's going to be hard for me to demonstrate this on the stream, but like if you want to create uh, a new filter or a preset or something like that, you can do it in here. It'll actually open up Content Manager for you and you can create your own filters right there and it's it's actually really cool um but it also sort of shows you too much like while i'm in the game i don't need to filter download station like this is actually going to look on the download station right now and i don't have this stuff installed i don't know if i can install it from here but you know like i don't think that that should really be part of this but um another example here is like i've got a content filter for my content and buildings this will show all of my stuff but it also shows uh things that are obsolete so i by default i don't know like that could probably be improved but anyway you get the idea with that i usually just leave it on all content and then uh you know you could search in whatever you want csx and you know filter uh whatever this the fact that this whole window just turned into a big scrolling window i think is a bug and um i've mentioned it to the team i don't think that they care but if you guys also fill this out as a bug report maybe it'll actually get fixed because it shouldn't turn this whole window into a scrolling thing like if i if i don't have it selected the scroll bar is you know contained in here but the second i get to a certain length it wants to display it instead of scrolling through it i don't know it's really strange but um anyway yeah this is all of your assets that you have in here that you can select and uh you know once you have something selected in here um you know i'll just grab something snowplow it's, it's the same old, same old. You could just grab it and place it just like you did in uh, Surveyor Classic. And again, like before, when you click, you can click and hold and get a preview of where it is. And, you know, that works really a little bit better for like something like trees or shrubs. Like, let's say I want to put a shrub down, you know, I can kind of get a little bit of a better idea of where it's going to go. I have randomly rotate objects turned on, so it's not super helpful for things like uh, buildings, but it does give you the option to see uh, what it is before you place it. Um, what else? Yeah, again, like I said, you could filter through it as thumbnails if you want. I, I really don't love that. I mean, I guess it is kind of a cool way to, uh, to see things before you select them. I, I mean, I don't know. I could definitely see the use case for this, but I don't know. I guess I'm kind of used to just seeing it in a list. So for me, I keep it as a list. And then I've got my little preview window above so that I can see uh, what that's all about. 
Oh, yeah, hey, what's going on, Logan? Let me take a look at the chat real quick. <laughs> I'll stick with Surveyor Classic. You can stick with Surveyor Classic, but I'm just telling you right now, it's going to be phased out. So, <laughs> you know, start getting used to Surveyor 2 because that's going to be what the game is pretty soon. Um... Tim is asking, is there a way to differentiate between a spline point that is actually there versus one that can be added while editing the spline? Yes. Um, so let's let's take a look at that. So in Surveyor 2, we don't have those big clunky spline points anymore, right? So for better or for worse. Uh, for somebody like me, it's kind of a pain because I would use them when I'm doing handmade roads to, uh, you know, create markings and stuff like that. But uh, at the same time, it kind of does make it a little bit easier to create selection or to know, like, what I'm, you know, trying to modify, let's say. I think what Tim is asking here is, is there a way to know where you're going to add a spline point? So in Surveyor Classic, you used to have to open up another window here and then select another tool and then you could click wherever you want to create a spline point. With Surveyor 2, wherever you click, you can add a spline point right in that spot. So this, where this is highlighted, this little widget dot, this pixel, that is gonna be the point at which I can create a spline point. So to access that, uh, you click on this little tool tip widget thing here and you can insert a spline point right there. So now I've got a spline point right in that spot. Uh, so I guess this is also a good time to mention what, you know, what, how do you even modify any of the assets, uh, particularly splines and that sort of thing. You'll get two, when you have a spline um, selected, you'll get these little widgets that pop up and they give you different options. You've got cut, copy, paste, and delete. Uh, replace spline with asset selected. So if you have another spline in your, uh, your window here or another asset, this also goes for for trees uh, and things like that, you can uh, replace the object with whatever you have selected in your window. So if I wanna change this out with this truck, you know, I can do that just that easily. And it's right in that same spot. So, um, you know, if you just need to swap something really quick, like it's sort of like the bulk replace tool without being bulk replace. Um, anyway, I'm getting distracted there. So you get your little widgets here. I think these both have different options. So we'll look at the squiggly widget first. Uh, replace spline with selected, uh, paint under selected, that's an option if you want to uh, put a texture just specifically underneath uh, something like a piece of track so you can automatically have it lay ballast underneath. Uh, smooth ground under selected, that is uh, something that we all know and love, like let's say that this has uh, got some elevation to it and we want to you know, plateau the ground underneath, that is the tool that we would use. So now that brings everything up with it, all the terrain. Um, uh, and it's just the opposite too. Let's say this is up in the air and we want it on the ground. We can hit settle on ground and it will settle that spline and configure it to uh, the terrain. It just sits flat. Not, It doesn't sit flat, but you know what I mean? It follows the curvature of the terrain. Uh, what else do we have here? Apply height. So if you have a height in here, let's say 25. Uh, now I can say apply height and it will add it. it it'll raise it up to that level. Um, which is super handy. I mean, if you if you have a specific height, like let's say you're putting, <laughs> let's say you're a nut job like me, uh, and uh, you want to do road markings across a bridge or something like that, and you know the height that you need to 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 put it at, uh, you could just lay out your spline and then bring it up to that height value, and uh, you know you could just have it right there. So that's that's very convenient, very handy. You got straight and spline. We should know what that is. Um, insert spline point here, which I already covered. Select assets in palette. That'll bring it over to um, into here. It'll select it. And then edit properties. If you have any properties that you can edit, uh, it'll be in there. Uh, and this one at the end, this is supposed to be, this widget is for the spline point itself. So you get a couple different options in here. Um, you can apply height to this spline endpoint or apply a grade. So again, you would set the value over here in your tool options and you can set Let's say we've got that 25% grade still set. Uh, apply grade to the spline endpoint, and we will now have a 25% grade on that road. So again, that goes for your track, and it could be grass or anything like that, but I think specifically 
uh, you're gonna use that probably for track. Um, and this is kind of handy for like somebody like me, like when I'm building like something like a model railroad, let's say, I usually just build it all at grade, all flat, you know, on the on the baseboard, and then I'll add the gradients and stuff like that. So doing it this way allows you to add that kind of consistent, you know, 3% grade or 2% grade, where whatever it is that you want. It's a little bit more intuitive, I think. Um, we've also got merge spline points. So again, if we have... Uh, one section here with a spline point in the middle. We can select that spline point and we can either separate it or we can merge it. Uh, so there I merge it and it is gone. It dissolves it. Uh, what else do we have here? Yeah, and that's pretty much it. We've got change junction direction. So again, if we have a turnout, we can select that, grab our widget and change the direction. That's how you throw the switch. So previously you had to go into your toolbar and uh, f pull out the tab to do that. And then I think there was even like another drop down for advanced tools that you had to hit. So yes, you still have to click into like a menu here to do that, but it's like three less clicks. <laughs> so, uh, 44 willies, five bucks. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. And your work on the PNP has also been appreciated. Uh, let me, uh, it looks like the chat was kind of going here for a minute. So let me catch up with that. Um, my throat is already getting sore. It's been a while since I did one of these streams, you know. Uh, I've got coffee. This is coffee. This is black coffee. I might need to get some more in order to keep going here. <clears throat> How much will the PMB cost? I don't know. I haven't decided. To, uh, I haven't gotten to that point yet. Um... Can you change bridges now? I'm not sure what you mean by that. You could always uh, change them. I think that like if you had another asset, if you wanted to select an asset and uh, do that bulk sort of switch, you certainly could do it that way. Uh, here's a good question from Tim. Again, how far does the selection go from where you click? It will only be on that segment. Um, so like, let's say, Oh, so I guess I should also mention this. When you, this is one of the things about Surveyor 2 that I actually really, really, really love. Uh, so I'm gonna, this is kind of an aside, but you guys are gonna love this too. When you have something like a spline s selected, let's say I wanted to move this spline over here. I used to have to, you know, grab this spline point and then grab this one down here and try to get it lined up, right? I don't have to do that anymore. If I want, I can select this and I can just move the entire spline all at once. Now, that's great on its own, but how much better is this? Maybe I want to move this median and these trees. I can, holding select, so I'm holding select, I can click on pretty much as many objects as I want and create a huge selection. And I can, oh, let me get the end caps too. And now I could just, oops, I could just slide the whole thing over. Or if I need to change the height, I could just change it. You know what I mean? And th using the fine adjustment tool and having access to the different axes, I could just slide it straight parallel over all at once. And you know, the same goes for everything here. Like if I wanted to move this whole road, I could use the marquee tool. What's kind of cool is if you have either the free move tool or the find adjustment tool selected, you can just draw your marquee. You don't have to you don't have to like select that tool. Uh, but let's see, I got a piece of track, so I don't want this piece of track, so I'm gonna hit select, and I'm gonna click. I don't want this shrub. I'm gonna hit select, or uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna hold shift and I'm gonna click, and that will unhighlight it. So now, if I want to move all this stuff, I can just do it. Just like that. That by far is a game changer alone for me. You know, for somebody who does the kind of just crazy stuff that I do like with these parking lots. Hey, I don't want all of these parking lot splines to be right here. I want to move them down a little bit. I could just do that. Uh, what the weird thing is, is that occasionally it tears the, uh, the ground texture. I don't know why it does that sometimes. It doesn't always do it. Uh, so I don't know if that's a bug or what, but that does occasionally happen. So 
uh, just be forewarned. But again, you know, if I wanted to just move just this one, I can. And I believe, so there's, when you do this with the multi-select tool, you'll see all these different widgets pop up. I think you want to use the middle one to move it. If I'm not mistaken, this one has to do with your, the bounding box for your marquee. And I think this is the one that glitches out the ground texture. Yeah, because it's trying to move the texture along with it. Uh, which we don't want, but what we do want is to just move the meshes. So that's that. That, to me, is just the biggest, one of the biggest things ever. The other thing that you can do with either one of these tools, the free move tool or the fine adjustment tool, uh, which is also super, super handy, is create a massive selection of the same asset. So <coughs> the best example I can give for that is like a tree. I've got this tree selected. Let's say I want to select all of this same tree. I can just double click on it and it'll find all of the trees nearby. You can see there's some in the background there within like a certain radius. I don't know how big it is, uh, but it'll just make a massive selection on that. So a better example might be um, maybe with these trailers here. So if I double click on it, it's going to it's going to make a selection for the other objects that, the, that are exactly the same. So I, let's say I didn't want it anymore. I don't want these these uh, these box trucks here anymore. These trailers, you know, I can just make a uh, a big selection just like that, you know, and I could delete them. Super easy. Uh, I see the chat is moving. What else? What's going on? Uh, does the grade tool work with multiple assets selected? That is another question in there that I wanted to. Uh, does the new surveyor allow straight splines that join? It, the spline behavior is all still the same in terms of like how you connect them. Um, excuse me. Uh, it, it all still behaves the same. So, you know, you lay out your spline and you can kind of continue to sort of click around like that. Uh, what is nice though, so when you lay out a spline, for example, uh, before, as soon as you're done clicking, it leaves it highlighted so you can access the widgets without having to change any tools or anything like that. And let's say you want to make sure that it's going to be straight. You can say, uh, where is it? It's going to be this mid middle widget. Straight and spline. So then now when I go to click next, let's say we want to straighten this one. You know, previously that would require me to have to go over here and like select tools and blah, 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 and it's it's a lot. It's a big time saver, in my opinion. Um, Tim was asking about the gradient tool. I don't know how that, you know, that's kind of a good question. Uh, apply grade. I think it only does one. Do I have a grade set? Uh, let's do like that crazy. So let's uh, select. So uh, again, I guess I didn't mention this either. You could either select like the whole spline itself. Like right now, that whole white marking is selected as indicated by the highlight. Or you can just click on one of the spline points and you can make your modifications that way if you wanted to. Uh, but I want to try what Tim was asking. Uh, apply grade. So yeah, it does. So you can select more than one spline and apply a gradient to it. Um, oh, another, this is gonna be just like a little tip for you guys that are using Surveyor 2. When you have any tool selected, if you hold down, what is it, the Alt button? If you hold down the Alt button, you'll get the, it'll switch to the eyedropper tool. And you'll see me doing this like nonstop. So I, I, like I said, I always have the fine adjustment tool selected. Uh, and then I'll hold down the alt tool just to get like the quick eyedropper tool. So that allows me to just make a really quick selection for something. You know what I mean? Like I want this texture or this guardrail or whatever it is, you know. Um, another thing is with the eyedropper tool, if you hover over whatever it is long enough, it not only tells you what it is, J-R-R-M, it gives you the QID as well as who made it, the author. So you can get a lot of contextual information just from that. Um, 
so I know like if I'm doing a live stream and you guys ask me, hey, what is that that tree or whatever, you know, I can just hold down the alt button and hover over it and it'll tell you exactly what the Kuwait is and who the author is. And I believe it does the same thing over here in the assets window. Yeah, <coughs> it does the exact same thing. So it'll tell you what the Kuwait is, the name, as well as it says US road sign. I wonder if that's the, the, the description. Now I'm curious. Yeah, so it must give you a little like brief description as well. Uh, can you switch between Classic and 2.0 or are you forever stuck with one? So right now you can, or up here at the Tools tab, you can easily switch between Surveyor 2 and Classic and you can go back and forth without having to save or do anything like that or relaunch. That is gonna go away eventually. I don't know what the timeline is. That is gonna disappear. Um, it's all gonna be Surveyor 2. Surveyor 2 is gonna be the new thing. They're trying to slowly, uh, you know, get people used to it and transition people into it right now. Because um, there's a lot of people, and I'm sure a lot of you guys that are here, probably don't want to switch. I didn't want to switch either, but there's a lot of really helpful things in here that uh, I think, you know, yeah, there's gonna be a bit of a learning curve, but overall, it is a way more robust way of route building than Surveyor Classic. Um, Five dollars from 44 Willies. Uh, is it possible to preset the tilt of an asset like grass group set to multiple on a slope? Uh, you know, that is a really good question. I don't believe so. I think the only way that you could do that is if you have multiple of those objects selected. Uh, I don't believe you can preset it before you place it, but let's say I want to like rotate all of these trailers. I believe I can do that. Yeah, so I can make I can make a selection of multiple assets and indeed uh, apply a rotation or something to it. But you can't set that rotation value first and then place the asset down, at least that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, but you can make that selection. I would do it with these trees, but these trees don't allow any rotation at all, which is kind of strange. Uh, what else we got in the uh, in the chat here? Oh, if you uh, I see what you're saying, Tim. Tim's asking if uh, if I did that selection with the median and the trees, if the trees would go as well. I don't think that they will. Um, ah, got the wrong tool selected. Uh, I don't even know it's so because let's try it this way. So the last thing that I had clicked was a tree, so it's only gonna give me the options for the tree. So let me try selecting the spline. There we go. Uh, let's see, apply grade. Now the grade is set to zero. Let's change it to 25. Oops. Yeah, no. So it does not. It does not take the trees with it. I guess because it would. It doesn't really know what to apply the grade to. Although now, if I change to the height value, and I said apply height, I believe it would do. I believe it would do that. Let's change the height to like uh, 15 meters, and we'll say apply height. Oh, it does not. Okay, so if you set it for the overall spline, so I, this is the spline endpoint. Uh, if I set it for that, it does not work for that. If you use the spline widget itself, uh, it will do that. And I just saw something that I want to talk about as well that I think you guys are also gonna love because I've been making a whole lot of use out of it. Uh, let's say you're building on a hillside and uh, let's see, do I have any good examples here? Uh, I probably did everything already. So anyway, let's uh, let's grab one of these houses here. Let's say we want to put a house here. Uh, now you can see that a lot of it is floating, and you know we we don't really want that, right? We don't want floating houses. Um, so what we would do is we would usually go and grab our our grade tool, and you know try to even this out so that the house sits flat on the ground. But what you can do now is you can hit your little widget here and you can say settle on the ground. Oh no, 
sorry. Uh, smooth ground under selected. And what that is going to do is it's going to use the hitbox, basically, of that asset, and it's going to level the ground underneath. In the same way that we do that with splines and track, you know, where you want to bring the ground and the terrain up underneath it. Uh, so that is a way to do that. So um, it's not perfect, but it's better than using the grade tool or anything like that to try to uh, make that work. Uh, so that is super useful in my opinion, and obviously that goes, you know, if we have this thing like raised up into the air, uh, and we say uh, smooth ground under selected, it'll bring that up. Um, and also if we just happen to place this high up in the air for some reason and we don't want it there, we can use settle on ground and it will uh, bring it down to the ground. So, super useful. Um, <clears throat> I, I really like that feature as well. Uh, what I'm going to do, I, I've got a whole lot more to talk about, but I, my throat is killing me. So, let me get, take two minutes. I'm going to get some more hot coffee because that helps my throat. And uh, you guys start uh, putting some more questions in the chat, and I'll be back in just a second. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I am back. Okay, so what else uh, do we need to talk about here? Okay, <clears throat> scrapbook. Scrapbook is the big one. Uh, you know what I'm gonna do really quick though? I'm gonna exit surveyor. I'm gonna not save anything that I did because what I'm about to do, I might wanna save, so. Um, let's get back into here. Oh, I forgot to talk about the layers tab and all of that. So we'll get into that now. And then we will do the scrapbook because that is probably really one of the biggest uh, new copy paste features in uh, Surveyor 2. And it's probably one of the most useful ones. And if there's anything that is going to make you uh, move to Surveyor 2, I think it's going to be the scrapbook. Uh, so... I can't stress enough how awesome the uh, the scrapbook actually is. Okay, so uh, oh, so I mentioned the the layers tab over here. This is the same as it was in Surveyor Classic, uh, except this time we can actually see uh, the uh, effects layers: your grass, your flowers, and if you were to do a color effects layer, that would be in here. Um, as many effects layers as you have will get stacked in here. Same with your route layers and session layers so that's how you can go through and select and toggle things on and off uh, just how you would previously uh, so you can see i've got some rolling stock on the session layer obviously uh, so we will stay selected on the route layer you can lock everything this is super handy this is something that i have been complaining about uh, for years since um, they introduced layers is that there was no way to know what layer you even had selected so now it's right there uh, and it's right in front of my face, and I still make the mistake of building on the session layer instead of the route layer, but uh, whatever. Now I just have myself to blame, and I can't blame the UI. Um, just reposition my mic a little bit here. 
we don't have to have it right in my face. Okay, so that's that. Let's talk about the scrapbook. The scrapbook is the number one game-changing awesome thing with Surveyor 2. And uh, mind you, I'm, I'm saying this is not sponsored, I'm not getting paid, and I'm not going to get a bonus or anything like that for trying to get you guys to, to switch to Surveyor 2. This is purely my own opinions and uh, excitement for this. Uh, oh, you know what? You guys might want the, uh, the link for the Discord. <laughs> let, me, let me put that in there now. I meant to do that in the beginning, so you guys will love it. Um, let me link to my Discord here. Invite people. Let's see. Expire after one day, no limit. All right. Sorry, mods. <laughs> uh, let's see. Paste that in the chat. There we go. And where's OBS? Bring that back up. Okay. Okay, so with the scrapbook, the scrapbook is the new way to do copy and paste, okay? Uh, essentially, in its most basic form. Uh, let me think about the best way to, uh, to start this. When you first get trains, you will have some pre-built-in scrapbooks that start right here. So there's actually, they, they put some turnouts that you could copy and paste in and some different track configurations and yards and stuff like that. I have absolutely no use for that and I don't think most people would. Uh, we've got some grass stuff built in, uh, a yard ladder, some crossovers, uh, some trees, so on and so forth. Essentially, what you're going to do, what you're going to, how you're going to use this, I guarantee you, is that you're going to create your own scrapbooks for different use cases. When you create a scrapbook, um, essentially what you're doing is you're gonna use this marquee tool, and you know what, let me just show you what scrapbook looks like first, before I even talk about how I use it, or how to use it. So here is a perfect example. I created a scrapbook of this other area on the PNB. It doesn't even have to be on the same route. You can take a scrapbook from one route to another. Uh, which is super cool. So this is just happens to be on the PNB. I copied this area from another part of the PNB, and now what I can do is I can paste it, you know, as its own big chunk. You know how we used to do it. You know, kind of create a marquee and you paste it in, or I can paint it on. And when I do that, I can select what exactly I want to paint down. I can do the height. So it gives you a couple options here. You got no height, absolute height, and relative height. I usually have it on none when I'm working with meshes, uh, but obviously each case is going to be a little bit different. Uh, the next option you have is texture. I'm going to overwrite. You can have it not place any textures. Uh, the next is going to be meshes, none, add, and overwrite. I'm going to add. Um, next is splines, same thing. I'm going to say none for this particular one. And effects layers, none. So this doesn't change what you've copied it changes what you're going to paste down so right now i'm going to paste down no ground height so it's going to conform to the terrain i'm going to overwrite whatever texture is here so if there's no texture uh, i'm going to overwrite that if there whatever texture is here is going to get overwritten i'm going to add the meshes so let's say i paint over top of one of these trees it's not going to erase those trees that are here it's just going to add to them uh, splines, I'm not going to do anything with splines because I don't have any splines selected, but it would do the same thing as the meshes. And if you had any effects layers copied, like grass or um, uh, turf effects or clutter effects, uh, it will paste that down. So now what I'm going to do is select from my brush tool, I'm going to go to scrapbook data. And underneath that you have two different tools, brush and clone. It defaults to clone. I'm going to leave it on clone for right now, uh, and then we'll look at the brush one. Uh, so now what I want to look at is my tool options, my radius. I'm going to keep it at 20 meters just for the sake of this. Sensitivity, I don't know if this actually has an effect on anything other than the texture. Uh, I think it's just the texture, so I'm going to just leave it at 100%. Rotation, uh, I'm going to leave it at zero, but again, using your bracket keys, you can modify your rotation however you want, and that's fine. Scale, so this is extremely important when you're pasting things down. You want to have your scale 
uh, set it to whatever you want, but if sometimes it glitches out and it'll be at like 0 0.01. And what'll happen is if you paste down at that low of a scale, it's gonna take all the assets that are in that scrapbook and condense them into, you're just gonna end up with like literally 10 million assets piled onto itself and it's just gonna crash your game. So really make sure you pay attention to scale. So if you leave it at 100%, that is gonna be one to one ratio. So whatever you copied, when you paste it down, it's gonna be exact. When you go smaller, it condenses it with the scale. If you go larger with the scale, it's gonna stretch it out a little bit, okay? So, hey, what's going on with simulations? Uh, so what we're gonna do is I've got everything selected and now I'm just gonna click and I'm gonna paint. And what you'll see is that it's kind of creating, uh, it's a little uh, tiled, right? Um, but it essentially just pasted everything down that I had copied. So again, this is going to be completely dependent upon how big of an area you copied. I didn't copy a huge area, so it's a little bit more tiled, but I can, I can change that. I can, it doesn't have to be as tiled as it looks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deselect. If you have a bunch of assets selected and you want to deselect, you could either click away with one of these tools, or if you hit control D, it deselects. Um, and what's also really cool is if you hit the undo button after you deselect, it will undo your deselection so you can go <coughs> go back and have everything selected again uh, but I don't want that so anyway you can see that is uh, it's a little bit tiled we, we don't really want it tiled right so let me get rid of that let's up the scale to like 200% so now it's gonna stretch it out a little bit more and now you can see as I go the trees are a little bit more spaced out there's still a little bit of tiling but again that was a little bit dependent on how I made the copy and the area that I copied. Now I'm just continuing to paint, all right? So what is gonna happen is until I let go, it's it's basically gonna tile it out, right? But I can let go and I can just go ahead and start placing stuff down again. The thing to note here though, is that every time you click, it starts from the same place in what you've copied. So you can see I clicked, I've got this little group of trees here. If I click again, I get that exact same group of trees and rocks. So it doesn't, it's not like random. It starts from the same place within um, your area that you had copied and selected. But the cool thing is, let's say I don't even want to use any of these trees or shrubs or anything like that. I can just turn that off, turn the meshes off, turn splines off. And now what I've got is just the ground textures. So let's say I just like that, you know, palette of, uh, of ground textures. I can just paint that you know, just as I normally would with the brush and cover quite a nice large area. And you could even use your rotation key while you're doing it, I think. No, you can't hold the rotation key while you're doing it, but you can rotate it in between and get some different patterns. So this is super handy instead of having to go through and say, I like these different tones of grass and mud and that sort of thing. Uh, and I have to go through and make a selection each time and, you know, whatever. Uh, I can just copy an area and now I've got sort of a template and I'm painting with all six of these textures all at once. Super handy. And again, I could change the scale on that. If I go up to like 500%, uh, you get a slightly different pattern. And again, if I turn the sensitivity down to like, I don't know, let's go to 10%, uh, it will make it a little more, a little softer, I think. I don't know, maybe not. Anyway, you guys get the idea there. Okay, so that is what it looks like with the clone tool. So now if we have the brush tool, this is a little bit different. I, I think the way that I understand it, I haven't used it too much. I think the brush tool will paste it out exactly as it is. Let's try meshes add. Yeah, so what you get, <laughs> every time you click, you get that whole area that you copied will will be pasted down. So, you know, this looks a little tight here. So maybe what we want to do is uh, try that again and go for uh, a larger area. So now the scale uh, modifier tool uh, does not apply with the scrapbook brush. It is completely dependent on your brush size. So now everything is gonna scale with the size of my brush as opposed to uh, the scale of whatever. So, you know, an area like this that I want to be kind of swampy, 
Um, you know, if I wanted to cover like a big, you know, patch back here, you know, maybe I want to do something like this, rotate it, paste it down. I get a little bit of variety. Uh, but if I wanted to get up against the water's edge and get something a little bit more detailed, I'd probably want to use the clone one, the clone tool, drop my radius down a little bit, and maybe drop my scale to like 150 or so. And that gives me a little bit more control so I can maybe just paint the, the edge. I'm kind of, I'm being sloppy right now, but <laughs> you know, I could just do something like that. And let's say I just need to, you know, move some of these guys. I can make my selection and I don't know, you know, move it just like that. What about this little group here? We can move these over here. There we go. So now we've, <laughs> look how quickly we've made a forest in this, in this area, you know? Sure, it's a little bit tiled in some places, but you can change that. I'm just spitballing here, you know, uh, doing, just demonstrating really quickly how you can do some of this stuff. Um, again, I can select all these rocks and just sort of move them all at once if I wanted to, just by double clicking or whole groups of trees or whatever. Um, but this is super helpful. I'll tell, I'll show you how I've been using it for these background trees. So I created a whole, a uh, little scrapbook here that's just my background trees. So I can just go ahead and set this to like 50 meters or whatever. And I think I usually have it about 150 scale. And now I could just go ahead and just forest this entire background area super easily. And so the nice thing is because I'm holding down the click button, I haven't released left mouse click left mouse button if I go back over an area it's not going to continue to add trees on top of each other so they're not going to paste into each other but now if I let go and then I start painting again then it's going to start overriding well in this case it's adding to it if I went to um, overwrite then it's going to delete what is there and overwrite it so again super quick way for pasting out a whole bunch of background trees and again, you could change the scale. Let's say that's a little bit too sparse. I'll go back down to 100% and I can make it a little bit tighter if I wanted to. And, you know, just by picking up and like letting go and starting again and kind of doing different areas, maybe rotate it a little bit. You know, I can now forest, not only just forest, but like it's putting down the ground texture too. You know, I can go ahead and just get this whole area covered. You know how long that would have taken previously, even with using copy and paste? You know? Um, I think... Yeah, this is definitely some intense music, isn't it? Uh, the other way that I've been using this that I really, really enjoy, and I think that this uh, is probably one of the best ways to use it, aside from the, the background trees, is I've created some little trackside grasses and weeds. So I'll show you what I mean here, because I've been using it really extensively between Highland and Grafton. Uh, this, you can use your scrapbook almost like, uh, what is it, the, the clutter or the turf effects. So if you create yourself a little template with a few little flowers and weeds and stuff like that, which is what I did here. I've got some weeds, I've got some Queen Anne's lace, some purple flowers, and just some little stuff like that. I created a little template, and now what I can do is just paint this all along my tracks. So let's go to an area I haven't done, let's say like over here. So I've got my scrapbook selected here, and what do I want to do? I want to be able to paste down, I, I named it, I named it Wildflower so I know what it is. So wait, I've got one that is flowers and weeds. So we're gonna use that one. So again, I made um, a little scrapbook and I'm gonna paste these down. So we're gonna do ground height, none. We're gonna do texture, none. I, don't, I like the texture that's there. I don't wanna overwrite the texture. Mesh, I'm gonna add so that way it doesn't accidentally start deleting these trees. Splines, I've already got my spline grass down, so I don't need that. But if I had splines, I would select probably add. Uh, and I'm not using any effect layers for this. So now what I can do, let's do scale like 125. And now I'm just gonna click once. And I've got like a little assortment of trackside weeds and flowers. And you know, if I wanna add it again, like over here, there we go, that's nice. All right, maybe I don't like that. Maybe it's a little too dense. Let's just change the scale to 200%. There we go, it's a little less dense. Uh, let's add, you know, a few over here. Yeah, that looks great. And I could just 
Maybe that's a little too close. Let's move this back. You know, super quick way to just get tons of wildflowers and shrubs and grasses and weeds and stuff like that into an area very quickly and very easily. I did it here. And where's the other area I was working on? <clears throat> yeah, I did it in this little meadow here. And yeah, you might get a little bit of tiling, like I said, but it's very easy to just grab a few things, make a selection, move things around. It's really not a problem at all to, to just adjust. So the one thing that I haven't uh, mentioned is how do you even create a scrapbook, right? How do you create your own scrapbook thing? Uh, so you do it with the marquee tool. So literally all you have to do is just draw out your marquee and everything that is selected in green here uh, will be added to your scrapbook. So the way that you would do that, you could either uh, hit the copy button off of your widget or you can do control C. I don't really want to copy all of that. Let's just do like these trees here. So I can hit control C and now you can see down here in my little scrapbook palette, it created a new scrapbook. So everything that was in within the bounding box of this marquee tool and is highlighted has been added to the scrapbook and copied. Uh, essentially just imagine it as like, you know, the clipboard or whatever. Um, so now, you know, when you go to paste, you can use any of these tools here to make your decision about what you want to paste down. Now, the thing with scrapbooks is they expire after five days. And I think this is just so that you don't end up with like a million scrapbooks um, that, you know, you're only gonna use once, but you forgot about or something like that. So after five days, this is gonna disappear. Let's say you don't want that to happen. Let's say you wanna keep your scrapbook. You can just hit this little pin and now it's saved it. Now it's not going to expire. But what if I don't care? I could just unpin it. Uh, if I don't want it anymore, I can click it and delete it. Not a big deal. Um, we'll delete that one too. Uh, if you want to rename it, you literally just click into the window here and you can name it. Let's just say like Marsh Group. And that's it. So now it's renamed. I've got it pinned, so it's not going to disappear. And uh, these are all the ones that I have saved right now. So I think you guys had probably seen in uh, the last episode, I used the scrapbook to paint out all of the, uh, the mud and stuff around here. And I just sort of used that as a good starting point. You know, I had like, I don't know, a dozen or so textures um, selected and I painted them out. And full disclosure, I made that copy off of another route. It wasn't even one that I came up with. It was another route that had uh, some texturing that I really liked. I had no idea what those assets were. And instead of taking a whole bunch of time to create like a pick list or something like that, I could just create the scrapbook and copy those textures and then bring them right over into the world here. And I think the palette might still, yeah, right here. So this is what it looked like when I pasted it in, not the buildings, but all the, the textures. So that was sort of my starting point. Um, if you guys have any other questions like about the scrapbook or anything like that, like I'm gonna be running out of things to uh, talk about soon. Somebody's asking for a map view. Here's a map of Grafton. Uh, this is the whole route. So there you go. Um, and yeah, we're on a, we're, I've got a session loaded up here. So all the train cars are uh, all, you know, functioning, I guess would be the term. I, I, I switched this out, I think during a Patreon live stream like a week or two ago. Uh, so that was a lot of fun to do. And you know, all the freight cars that are up in Grafton here uh, all need to be switched and worked. And I just uh, sent the train out of here actually to uh, Allegheny the other day. <laughs> Bill M is proud of what you have done coming from the original PMB. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Much appreciated. Um, uh, if you don't have the text, will it paste? A, is it, will it paste a placeholder? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. I think when you make a copy, let's see, the the text that gets defaulted into there. Let's say we make this. I think it just gives the date and the time. Yeah, so it creates a date and time. Uh, is the default name. So you can just leave it as that or you can rename it, whatever. Uh, I like to rename it so I know what it is. The other thing that I've been told is that you'll be able to export these um, scrapbooks through Content Manager, you know, it's like a CDP. Uh, I haven't 
seen that yet, but I guess it exists. I'm not really sure. So essentially, like, you know, you, you, your friend could make some uh, scrapbooks for, you know, different things and send them to you to use on your route if you wanted to. And like I said, like some of the things like useful case scenarios for uh, for the scrapbook are things like, you know, trackside flowers and, and weeds and stuff, but also like debris, you know, let's say you want to do, I've got like a million scrap yards. I feel like all I build on this route is like scrap yards. You know, I could make a copy of, uh, you know, the textures and all of the assets that are here in the scrap yard, all this debris and detritus and stuff like that. And now I can just paste it all, you know, and, and save myself a ton of time on the next uh, scrap yard that I inevitably end up building. Or, you know, something else is like, <coughs> excuse me, like a, um, like cemeteries, you know, right now, most of the cemeteries that are like on the PNB, I had to place all of those gravestones. Um, and, uh, let's actually do a case study here. Cause I think this is going to be a good example. Uh, you know, I had to place all these down and I had to copy and paste. I, like I made a template and I copied and pasted it, but in Surveyor Classic, when you pasted things down, you were beholden to the grid. You could only ever paste in 90 degree increments, right? You can only do east, west, north, south, right? So in uh, Surveyor 2, let's say we want to create a little template here. Excuse me, I got hiccups now. Let's, uh... Can I rotate this? No, not quite. So I guess the marquee is still sort of stuck you know, in, in its orientation. But let's say we wanted to try not to get these trees. Uh, let's say we want to make a, you know, another cemetery or something like that. We can make this into a scrapbook asset here and we can paste this down. And when we paste it down, we will not be beholden to 90 degree grid increments anymore. We can rotate it however we want. Uh, so let's see, height, none. Texture, none. Meshes, add. Spines, none. So, I mean, we could obviously just sort of paint it all down. We could do it that way. Uh, or we can, uh, we can also make a selection. Oh yeah, all right, so I just thought of a couple things. So we can actually make a selection and we can paste within that selection. Uh, so now it will paste directly into uh, that selection from the scrapbook. And we can, of course, rotate this however we want. So there is that, and then obviously, like I said, we can change the rotation to whatever we want. We can make it 90 degrees if we want when we paint it down. Uh, we can make it, where's the rotation? My eyes are getting blurry. Uh, like 100 and, we'll do like 240 degrees. So now we're not stuck pasting things like this that are really obnoxious to do down in, you know, 90 degree grid patterns. If the scrapbook you receive contains things you don't have, what happens? That, that, exactly, I have no idea. That's why I'm not really sure if this has been actually implemented or not, because, you know, if I send you a scrapbook and it's got a bunch of assets that are, you know, from a third-party website that you don't have, like, what is it gonna, what's it gonna paste down? Is it gonna give you an error? Like, I, I really have no idea. Um, Tim says, back to spline question, if I'm building something elevated, can you set the height of the spline prior to laying it? That way I don't have to change the height after the placement. I don't think so. I, I don't believe that that works. You still have to... Yeah, as far as I understand, like none of this is highlighted. So from my understanding, uh, when, you, when you're placing down assets, they're always gonna be at an absolute height and then you can modify them from there um, but I did just think of something that I wanted to mention as well um, that's really cool with the marquee tool if you create a marquee selection uh, you can actually set a height value let's say 50 I don't know how high we are and you can say set marquee to brush height and now it's going to uh, raise or lower the terrain uh, within that marquee and I'm gonna tell you why this is useful because, <laughs> we, and we've all been here, we've all been this guy. You, oh, hey, these guys need to go. I'll have to delete those another time. Uh, when you want to add a new baseboard, which, by the way, you do by just just dragging, literally, like you create a, a selection and you could say add baseboard. 
you, now you have the choice of doing HD, 5 meter, or 10 meter. Um, but yeah, you can, and you can add as many as you want. If, I think if you zoom out, yeah, you can just sort of draw like a huge area if you want to add a bunch of baseboards all at once. This is the way to do it. Say, uh, add new baseboard. This is just going to be a 10 meter baseboard. But now, oh man, I've got this huge height difference here. How do I, you know, get my terrain to match, you know, quickly? You could just use the marquee tool. And what I can do is using the eyedropper. Oops, I think I hit the undo button. Doesn't matter. Using the eyedropper tool, if I just get a sample from anywhere, it's going to tell me what the height is. It's always going to sample the height as well as, you know, whatever. It samples everything, okay? So your eyedropper tool will tell you what the height is. So I can see the height value is 61.15 meters. I can then take my marquee tool and I can just sort of draw out this huge area. And now I could say, set marquee to brush height. Boom. Now all three of those tiles I brought up roughly to the level of the adjacent terrain. And I didn't have to like use the terraforming tool and all that kind of nonsense. Obviously, you're still going to have to fix a lot of these, you know, uh, terrain imperfections. You're, you're, there's no way around that, you know. Um, but, you know, I always do that with the, uh, the grade tool. You know, get a, a large brush size medium medium to large to turn the sensitivity down and you know you can kind of begin to smooth out some of this stuff maybe like make it like 40 percent so it's a little bit quicker you know and then that that's the best way in my opinion at least to smooth out some of these seams and you know once you get good at it you kind of learn that it sort of averages out the difference in height makes it a little bit easier all right, so that's that. Uh, what else we got in the comments here? Am I going to do another side-by-side -side video, comparison video of the route now and the original? I don't have any plans to, but some people have been asking me, so I probably could. I got to look and see if I have the footage from the last time I did the, the whole thing, like on the original route, because um, if I don't, I don't, I don't have incremental saves like I used to, so I don't know. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to, th I don't think there's really much else to cover here. Um, yeah, I mean, again, just, uh, just to recap some of the stuff that you could do, you know, if, if I want to move like an entire spline or something like that, an entire trackside spline, I could just grab it and drag it. Uh, which is super helpful or if I want to move like a whole bunch of trees or something like that all at once uh, Whoops, I hit the copy button uh, I can do that. I can just delete that. I can delete that um, You know and it, it makes things like you know these parking lots a lot easier to manipulate like if I have like a whole bunch of parking lot lines that I want to move I can kind of create a selection and uh, move them um, and again, it's sort of like in Photoshop or, you know, other 3D modeling programs where if you hold shift while you're selecting things, uh, you can continue to select more and more things or deselect them as you go. Uh, it does get a little bit tricky. I will admit probably one of the biggest weaknesses with Surveyor, and it's really not even that bad. Uh, you'll just get used to it, is trying to select the right thing that you're trying to select. So. The best example I can give is in Surveyor Classic. Let's go back to Classic for a second. You know, if I wanted to move a tree, I could just move the tree. Wow, I gotta change this music. What is this? This is way too heavy. <laughs> this is supposed to be relaxing. Okay, so if I, uh, if I wanted to move this tree, I had to go to the object and then I had to go to object mode and then there was like spline mode, right? So I didn't have to worry about, you know, accidentally selecting a spline when I'm trying to move a tree or a shrub or something like that. If I want to move a spline, I go into spline mode and I can find splines and I can move the that specific spline without having to worry about moving a tree. But enter Surveyor 2 and there's a chance that, let's say I want to try to grab this spline. 
I might end up clicking a whole bunch of other crap before I even get to the spline. Or, you know, like this power line here. That was easy. This is a bad example, but you know what I mean? Like, there's no, because there's no differentiation between your tools, <clears throat> it is easy to select things that you don't necessarily want to be selecting. So you might end up selecting, uh, you know, a spline instead of a shrub or whatever, vice versa. I've found it to be particularly troublesome when I'm using the eyedropper tool and I'm trying to eyedropper something. It seems to want to get the texture like before anything else. Uh, and obviously that's because the texture takes up probably the most amount of real estate. So, uh, you know, that's where I found it sort of being the most of a pain, <laughs> I suppose. I guess the other thing uh, to note also is like when you're placing track side objects. Let me talk about that for a minute. Uh, this might be a good, good ending here. Uh, oh, show us how to use the water. I, yeah, I'll do a different route for that. Um, uh, what did I just say I was going to do? Oh, so things can get a little bit confusing when you're doing track objects and that sort of thing. So, for example, we've got these crossing plates here. You can actually move things that are attached to the track spline, like away from the spline. So I can like take this and move it like way over here. It's still technically attached to the track, uh, but uh, like, I, you know, I can move it around. That kind of becomes a pain when I want to put it back, right? Now I'm like, all right, how do I get this to, it, cause it doesn't really snap. Like it kind of does, but not really. Um, for things like this, you can hit this little widget and you can say uh, reattach to track and that'll snap it back. The pros and cons to this are as follows. <laughs> you can take things that would normally be, you know, a certain distance from the track, like a signal or a switch machine or something like that, and you can move it wherever you want. So again, you can see where that would be really useful, like something like a, uh, a signal. Maybe it's a little bit too close to uh, an adjacent parallel track or something like that, and you want to just move it over. It'll still maintain its connection to the track and still function as if it's, it is connected to the track, uh, but you can move it out of the way. Obviously, this becomes a problem with things that you don't want, like, you know, a switch machine being someplace really far away. Uh, so in order to avoid that, uh, well, there's no way, way to avoid it, but you would hit um, wherever it is, snap, reset, object, rotation, randomize. Am I just missing it or do I not have the right thing selected? So apparently this doesn't have reconnect to track. Is that possible? Reattach to track. Okay, so interesting. So certain assets, I guess, don't have that function. Uh, so that's strange. Uh, where this could kind of also get confusing is when it comes to like freight cars. Um, they will always snap to track. I don't think there's a way to like have them not snapped to the track. Um, but, uh, like for example, I can kind of, let me see. Yeah, so I can like drag it far away, uh, but it does always snap itself back to the track. So it can get a little bit confusing when you're trying to like lay out freight cars or anything like that. Um, I guess this is also a good time to mention how do you even select freight cars and things like that. I could either grab any freight car that I want and I can just move it where, where I want. If I want to move this whole consist, I do the same thing where I click on the, you know, one car and then I just double click and it will select the entire consist. And this isn't just like limited to the same type of freight car, it does the entire consist. Uh, so that's how you would go ahead and move things, um, consists. Uh, and again, you've got your little widget here so you can rotate the vehicle consist or rotate just the vehicle itself, like the engine or freight car uh, or the entire train as a whole. Um, and you've got other options in here, save to consist asset. So if I like this consist and I wanna make a you know, saved consist out of it, I can do it from there. Uh, so that is worth noting as well. Uh, what else we got? Uh, 
uh, a video on operations once the route is done. Yeah, I could probably do something like that. We're a little ways off, but uh, yeah, still got some time to go. Uh, one thing I guess also to note, and I, I don't really understand. Let me exit out of this. Uh, I'm not going to save anything. Let me come back to the route. Uh, I think that this has to do with Trains Living Railroad, which is a feature coming up in the game, but some of the some of the features of Trains Living Railroad are already present in the current version of the game. Uh, but for some reason, the uh, loads like in your freight cars don't actually appear until you drive the session. Like they don't always. I'll show you what I mean. They're they're not like if I tell the car the tr the game to load these freight cars right now it's not going to show me that animation or show that it's loaded until i drive the session so the best example i can give is i don't know i don't remember which one it is one of these two cuts of cars is actually loaded and i think it might tell me in the properties maybe it's these ones or maybe everything glitched out and i lost the load i don't know uh but if i go into drive oops Okay, so it took me to wherever I was last. Let's go back down to mine 78. So as soon as I unpause it, if there is loads in here, they will populate, yeah. So you can see how those just drew in. I don't know why it said it was empty in Surveyor. So again, I don't know if this is a bug or uh, you know, something it's supposed to do, uh, but, uh, yeah, it does not show you the loads. It actually still says that it's empty, so maybe this is a bug, because I don't see anything anywhere. Strange. Okay, uh, I'll have to mention that to the guys. I, I think that that's got to be some kind of a bug. Um, but anyway, that's, that's something that is worth noting. Uh, but I am now back in Surveyor, and the loads are there. So it, I guess maybe it has to draw them in, in this, like, when you load the session. I, I really have no idea. Uh, again, that's something I'll mention to those guys and see what they say. Um, let's see, before I leave the P&B, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to... Uh, your track machines do have that. So the thing is, there's... <laughs> there's two different uh little widgets here yeah and i can see that this this one does have reattached the track as well um <clears throat> it depends on what it what the game like what the game sees the asset category as so right now this is a track side object i believe it's considered um if it sees it as uh, a scenery object, it's not going to give you that option. So I don't know. It's, yes, you're right. Certain ones are going to have to reattach, and some of them are not going to have that. Um, all right, so let's exit out of here. I'll start a new route just for the sake of uh, showing you guys the water thing, and then uh, we'll call it quits. <coughs> the stream went way longer than I was expecting. I thought it would be maybe an hour. Uh, but if you guys have any other, like, last-minute questions, uh, now is the time to start spitting them out. Uh, let's create a new route. Uh, so, it, with the HD Terrain update, once you... I'm in HD Terrain. This is the Trains Plus feature right now. Uh, new routes, I believe, are all going to be HD Terrain right off the bat. Oh, and you know what? I can't even... I'll have to show you how to convert a route. That That's what it's going to be. Uh, when you're doing the water now, in the, the new way to do water, I don't like it. I would be perfectly honest. I, I really don't. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I don't even know, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. How do you add water? I believe it's going to be an effect layer. Yeah. I know, I made a video about this, so, <laughs> for N3V. Uh, so yeah, you create a new effect layer. That's right. This is all coming back to me now. Um, and you can change what kind of water it is. They're, they're supposed to add in the preview of whatever it is. We'll just leave it as calm for now. Uh, and then we can create it. Now, when you're working with the new water, uh, my understanding is that it is automatically 
already under the world. It's set to zero. And when we wanna, yeah, you can see here when I added this, you can kind of see it clipping in because we are at zero height and the water is also at zero. So that's number one, that's one thing that I don't like. So when you start a new world, if you are like me and you just start the, the, the map at zero and build up from there, when you add water by default, it's gonna be at zero. You can change this, it doesn't have to be. If you go to edit effect layers, you can change where, where it spawns. Uh, default value of zero, you can make it like negative 10 or whatever, uh, and that'll make it go underneath. I, I don't know if you have to do that right off the bat or not, but the thing with the water is when you are using it, uh, it works the way that building your terrain is. So like I can literally like make these hills of water. So this is what I don't like about it is that like it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like uh, you're not going to have water that's going to, you know, look like that. I guess the way to do it is to set your height you know, and, and work it that way so that it's all the same if you want it to be five meters. I don't love that. I liked the old water, you know, way. I mean, I guess this isn't awful, but uh, where the, the main feature of this is supposed to be and the fact that it kind of like curves too at the edges, that makes it kind of problematic in my opinion. Um, the main idea of this is that if you had like a creek or something like that or a stream, you can make it look like it's flowing. Um, I guess the way you would do that is probably with the grade tool uh, so that you can kind of get like a nice gentle slope going down. Uh, it's a little bit more trouble than it's worth in my opinion. Uh, I don't foresee myself ever really using this practically because it's just such a pain. Um, but if you have a lot of patience and that's the way you want to do it, you can do it. You can place the water down at the top and, you know, kind of like taper it downstream. It is a way to do it. Um, I will probably continue to use uh, splines and only use this for like big bodies of water. Um, they had talked about in the past actually having real water physics where you can kind of, you know, like in city skylines, but I forgot why they said they didn't want to implement that. It would have been too messy or something. But yeah, so essentially your water is going to be default set to zero and uh, you build it up from there. Uh, so that's where it gets kind of interesting is like if you've got like a lake over here and you want to have a lake over here, like technically they're, they're kind of connected, you know? So, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. There's practicality to it. I, maybe I just haven't used it long enough. I don't really care, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I, I just, uh, I don't care about the water. It, it is what it is. Um, so what's the other thing? Oh, so if you wanted to change like what, what it looks like, it's water is now in effect layer. So you have to go to your effect tab here and you can edit it. Uh, you have to take out the advanced menu and you can go ahead and change it uh, to however, whatever you want. So I guess the other advantage to this actually is, and I talked about this in my video and I completely forgot about it until just now. If you want to have multiple bodies of water with different properties, you can do that now. So, you know, whereas previously, oh, I'm tangled up. Uh, previously, you had one body of water and when you changed it from glassy to choppy or calm, it did what it's doing now. It changes it globally, right? So let's leave this as choppy. So all your water is going to be choppy, even if you wanted to make like a pond, you know, with no wind and, you know, a nice glassy pond, it was going to be choppy. But now what you can do is you can create another effect layer of water. We'll do calm water. Uh, there we go, and yep, whatever, and now we can select calm water, and there we go. So I don't know how these two interact with each other, though. That's interesting. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Uh, but yeah, so that's the number one benefit, I suppose, is that you can have multiple bodies of water with different properties. So I can go ahead and, you know, change these other ones around a little bit. 
without affecting this one over here. So that is kind of cool. Um, I don't know if you could change the color. What does this all do? I don't really know what this does. Uh, let's, can I make it 100? Is this going to make the water green? Yes, yes it is. <laughs> all right, so uh, we learned something today. Uh, if you want to actually... <laughs> <laughs> so that, all right, that maybe this might have just changed my mind, actually. Uh, I actually like that. So if, if you can, can I select a color in here? How do I do this? Uh, if you really want to uh, mess with the values, I suppose uh, you could make, you know, a, a swamp. Uh, I, I really, you know... Well, I, uh, you'd have to really sit and play, I guess. I don't know if there's a way to coordinate that a little bit better, but uh, maybe maybe that's uh, something to consider. I had no idea that you could do that until just now. Uh, that is hilarious. I kind of wish that maybe this had like a, you know, like over here in our color tint, we actually have RGB values that we can use. So it'd be kind of nice if maybe I could click into this color box here or uh, if this would even tell me what any of this meant. Um, <laughs> uh, who knew? I mean, that's that's really kind of that's cool. Uh, it, it, at least it shows you the preview right there. Uh, I guess this is also a <laughs> uh, good. Um, oh god, a, a good chance to uh, demonstrate the color effect uh, as well. Uh, so we'll create a new color layer and we'll just call this color tint. We'll just call it tint. <clears throat> uh, and I believe uh, so where it says color binding and it gives you this value here 20 meters that has to do with the size of your marquee on your uh, your brush tool so right now because it's set to 20 meters anything it's not going to let me dr uh, paint less than 20 meters uh, excuse me <laughs> So you have to, uh, if you want to do like a smaller area, like let's say if we want to do like 2.5 meters, it's going to give me this warning. I can go ahead and just say, yeah, whatever. I think, uh, let's save change. Yeah, sure. Maybe I can't do, I'm, oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Let me correct myself here. You can't, with the color tint, you cannot go smaller than five meters, I, I believe. So let's make uh, just a color tint. I'm still doing water, aren't I? Uh, this is where I always get mixed up is like just changing the tools. Uh, so yeah, now you can see uh, I'm adding color tint. And again, like I said, you don't have to make a new, this is where it gets confusing. You don't have to create a new color tint effect layer for each color. You could just go ahead and change it at any time. And you know, you could, do whatever you want. It's just like MS Paint. But like I said, the main advantage here is like, let's say we're stuck with this grass texture. We just want to get a little variety here or add a little bit of shadow <coughs> or whatever. I can just go ahead and just, you know, add some different variations to it wherever I want. Now it's a greener green grass, you know, without changing the, the, the texture at all. I can do whatever I want. And it seems that I could just layer as many of these as I want anywhere. Um, and again, I'll show you with, uh, since we're on an HD terrain, uh, route, map, whatever, uh, let's go to texture. I can show you if we take the texture tool all the way down, you can see how small that is. It's, it's absolutely insane how small this tool can go. Um, we will find a ground texture. Uh, like I can literally like sit here and like write my name if I wanted to. What is sensitivities at 100%? You know, like, look at how small this detail is. Uh, obviously, it has some LOD. That's, it kind of needs that. But, you know, if you were in really close, like, there, like, it's, it's, that's, you can just put your name in there. So, I'm sure people are going to have all sorts of uh, horrible fun with... <laughs> Uh, with this so you can do that with the textures you could also do that with the terrain height uh, which is really cool 
Uh, I believe you could do scrapbook. I don't believe allows you to go that small. Maybe it does. I don't know. Yeah, I guess it kind of does. I don't know what it's going to... What it would paste down at that level. But anyway, you guys get the idea about that. Um, what if you wanted to make a beach? I don't know. You'd have to really... That's where you have to get creative and sort of figure out what you're going to do. Uh, yard ladders tool? That's not really a tool that also is part of the scrapbook. Uh, I could show you that. I don't, you know, really love the idea of using the scrapbook for, like, turnouts or anything like that because, again, it's dependent on the size of your, uh, like, what you're pasting. So, like, if I change this scale to, like, 400% and I paste this down... Is it even gonna give me anything? It's not even, it's not even big enough to... Like, I'll just get this gigantic turnout. You know what I mean? So you're not gonna... I don't know how you would get that to be the right scale. You know, maybe with the brush tool? Maybe that keeps it the same scale? I don't really know, actually. Yeah, maybe that's the way to do it. Nope, because that changes the scale too. So I don't know, like something like the, the yard ladder, they've got these yard ladders built in. Maybe there's like a use case for this, but the fact that I can't preview what it looks like before I place it, uh, it's useless to me in, in that regard. Um, yeah, so like a yard ladder, let's just go ahead and add another baseboard. Scrapbook data. Like, so I've got it turned down, so now I've got this, like, super cute, tiny little yard ladder. Like, I don't know, maybe that's what you want, but uh, to me, that's just uh, kind of useless. Uh, that was on the brush tool, so that's going to be scaled based on the size of my marquee. So I can go ahead and paste that out. I could even go larger. Like, maybe, yeah, it's got some functionality to it. Um, if you wanted to just do something really quickly... Excuse me, uh, this does work in uh, multiplayer surveyor, so, you know, that's a possibility. Um, if I did this with the clone tool, it's going to get really kind of wonky, because uh, I've got the scale set to 400%, so you can see how much it spreads it out. Um, if I change it down to, we're going to do something dangerous, let's turn it down to like 20% and paste it. Uh, yeah, we get we get this. So now it just pasted a whole bunch of instances of this yard ladder uh, all over the place. And uh, they're super compressed on top of each other. And that's basically, it's based on the size of the uh, marquee that I have and the scale. So I don't know. You can try to make use of that and whatever. Uh, and I think that that's probably it. I can't think of anything else that is worth really mentioning right now. Um, doesn't seem like you guys have any other questions. I'll give it a second here and just take a peek at the, uh, YouTube stats here. We got 40 people watching at the moment. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Unless you guys have any other questions, I think that that's probably going to be the end of that this stream i'll just jump back over to the pnb briefly and we'll just fly around the pnb and i'll give it a couple seconds to see if you guys have any other questions for me before we wrap up here um I'm trying to think of what else there is to, to maybe mention about surveyor 2 um like i said there's still a few things that surveyor 2 cannot do that surveyor classic could do um and i'm sure there's going to be some some workarounds for that eventually you know for example uh one of the big things is the bulk uh bulk replace tool uh there is no bulk replace tool in uh surveyor 2 uh, so you know if you wanted to replace like every one of a certain type of tree or something like that that is not possible to do in surveyor 2 you have to switch to surveyor classic for that oh the other thing is if you um well we were talking about the water uh, if you wanted to upgrade the, the water on your route, you can do it uh, two different ways. You could either do the upgrade route, which is going to make the whole route HD, and it'll update the water at the same time. 
and there is another way to do it and I forgot I'd have to look at my video just go to the just go to the n3v YouTube page and you'll see the video for it there uh, so there's that uh, and again the other thing for me personally that is I need to figure out eventually is you know when I do my road markings uh, I used the spline circle points to sort of like get a rough size. You know, I found that the, you know, if I have a, a double yellow line like this down, I can lay uh, the white lines on either side uh, right at the edge of the spline circle. And that was like pretty much the perfect size uh, road width. And uh, now in Surveyor 2, we don't have that. So I have absolutely no... <laughs> no idea like how wide my roads are or anything like that so uh it gets a little difficult to uh to do that i don't i'm gonna have to figure out a new workaround um but again some of the advantages are like if i want to just you know make this a little uh you know this lane a little bit longer i can just select this spline point and i could use this green thing and just drag it down and it's just gonna move it right on axis like you know, I don't have to worry about it kind of going off that point. And I could just kind of grab this one and drag it out. And now, you know, I didn't have to, like, you know, try to figure out the width or anything like that, you know. So that works out pretty good. Um, uh, if you select every instance of a tree, does the replace command work? Let's try. So we've got that tree. Let's uh, select a different tree. I think it will. So let's see, we'll say replace object with selected asset. Yes. So now the thing is when you do this sort of like multi-click thing like I just did here, oops, I'll do that. Um, so, you know, if I double click, it'll select all of that same asset in the area, but there is a limit to it. It doesn't do it. Oh, hey, there's billboard trees still here. Uh, I don't know what the radius is. What is that? Maybe like 100 meters or something like that? I can't even get like an aerial view. So it doesn't do it across the entire map. It does it within like a reasonable distance, like 100 meters or something like that. In fact, it actually... Or no, it did select stuff over here. I was going to say, it looked like it only selected stuff in the direction that I was facing, which would be interesting. Um... Yeah, flowing water like city skylines would be really nice, but I could also see that being really problematic. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the other thing is, like, F9 will still take you into your grid mode um, when you press it once. When you press it a second time, it shows you uh, this version of the grid. So it shows you the world without textures, and then when you hit it again, then it brings everything back shows you all your textures so I again I'm not sure what the benefit is to just saying like I want to see the world without the ground textures I'm sure maybe there is like a use case for that but like normally for me like if I need to see the grid I'm kind of okay with just seeing it like this like a transparent grid so I don't know what the benefit would be for one over the other but uh, yeah <clears throat> so there's that um, Yeah, I guess that's that's probably going to be it. Um, you know, you guys know about the drone camera, too. I really like the drone camera, so it actually allows you to move around more realistically. <laughs> it's a little slow to, like, get around the world, but it makes for some really nice uh, panning shots and stuff like that if you're doing videos like me. Although you can't really, like, move. But you can get some really nice angles with the, the drone camera. I believe this was also in uh, available in Trains 19. I think my favorite part is that you can get really low to the ground and kind of get these shots where you're looking up. As opposed to, like, looking down. So that is pretty nice. <coughs> Alright, so I think that that's probably going to do it for today. If you guys have any other questions, you know, shoot it to me. Uh, over on Discord or wherever else. Let me put another uh, link to the Discord in the chat. Uh, invite people, copy. And uh, yeah, we'll just call it quits here for today. I mean, we've been streaming for a little over two hours, so. Um, 
I, I really thought this was only gonna last about an hour, so <laughs> I'd say it was a success. So hopefully you guys got something uh, out of that. Um, yeah, and, and hopefully you guys are gonna move over to Surveyor 2 because I really like it. I, I can't stress enough, you know, how much it has really improved my route building speed just for the fact that I can like copy and paste you know, areas of trees or grass or like those little trackside flowers and weeds and that sort of thing, or textures, like, you know, a whole bunch of texture all at once. Uh, it just makes it so, so much faster. And the fact that I don't have to click through every menu every single time to change a tool or anything like that. I've got my little keyboard mapped out with a bunch of hotkeys so I can kind of like change through things really quickly uh, and really rapidly. And honestly, Surveyor 2 has probably sped up my route building by like at least 30% if not maybe even a little bit more, um, just for that reason. And being able to select like whole groups of things also, you know, like like I said, if I wanna move like a group of cars or, you know, I think another good example is like, you know, if I wanna move all these houses back just, just a bit, I don't have to do each one at a time. I could just grab all of them and just slide them straight back. And now like, I, you know, before I would have to do them one at a time and like line it up. You know, and if I even wanted to, I can do it through, you know, the position, the X, Y, Z tag. Oh, that was the other thing that I should mention is like, if you have um, assets that you want to like set a height to, you can copy and paste it right into the, uh, where is it? I think it's this one. Yeah, right into the height value here, Z. So you can, can easily do it that way. But yeah, I mean, I can't, uh, can't say enough good things about Surveyor 2, I mean, I think it's great, and I think you guys will really enjoy it as well. So, uh, anyway, put the keyboard in the description. I'll tell you again what it is. This is a uh, Razer, uh, not, hashtag not sponsored, uh, Razer Tartarus version 2. Um, yeah, that's what it looks like there. And then this is the back. Just so you guys. If you want to get it for yourself, uh, I think it was like $100 or something like that. Um, again, I really like it, and, and this little keyboard setup also sped up my route building probably tenfold as well, because I'm just like, you know, <laughs> I can select all of the, the tools super quickly. Um, I've got, like I said, my, my arrow keys, I've got mapped to it, so I don't have to keep moving my hand from like one part of my keyboard to, the, to another. Like everything is just in one spot. Um, so yeah, anyway. All right, so guys, I hope you enjoyed this live stream. It went way longer than I thought it was going to. Uh, if you have other questions uh, or you're watching the playback, put them in the comment box below. I'm gonna try to add chapter markers and things like that to um, make it easier for people who are watching the playback and, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, hopefully I can do some more live streams going forward and actually do some route building and you know do some fun stuff with you guys. Uh, P&B is coming along really good. We'll do some operating sessions soon, I think. Uh, I have been doing some operating sessions during the Patreon live streams and hangouts and stuff like that. So if that interests you, uh, make sure you check that out. Patreon.com slash Uh But that's all for today, dudes. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'll see you guys next time.